All right, we're in the book of Matthew chapter 7. We're back on uh, Kingdom Living today. And uh, this is actually the final message in Kingdom Living. We're talking about a firm foundation taken from chapter 7, verses 24 through 29. And uh, as we conclude this, this has been a great study for us. We've uh, really found some tremendous information that will help us. I I'm telling you, if you really want to learn how to live the Christian life, learn what Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount. Today, as we continue and we conclude, the message today is significant, and it's significant basically for two important reasons. And uh, one is the church. Realizing today for the church, we have discovered that what life in God's kingdom looks like. Now, not only is the kingdom coming, but the kingdom is here now. And actually, the, the moment that you were born again, the kingdom of God came into you. So we talk about the church. We are the church. And kingdom living ought to be a priority today for every born-again Christian. So the church is very important. The second thing is personal, not only for the church, but also personal. We find ourselves in one of three circumstances in life. Either we are in a storm or we're headed towards a storm or we're coming out of a storm. We heard that proclamation before, and it's so true. You know, I, I want you to know I've stood in this pulpit of this church on Sundays and preached your know, message and facing storms in life when realizing the importance of the faith in God while in the midst of trying to encourage your heart. I personally, or we personally, were going through a personal storm that no one knew about. I think sometimes people think preachers don't have storms. <laughs> I promise you, I've got my storms and your storms too. And, uh, and then for the past several years, I've preached about having and facing those storms of life with unshakable faith. And, you know... And you realize for seven years, Cynthia uh, has fought a battle with a vein occlusion in her eye, getting an injection about every four to six weeks uh, in her eye. And uh, even when, honestly, uh, we felt crushed and even confused, we refused to give up on the firm foundation. And I'm sure you could tell of events and stories and account, uh, things that have happened in your life Two, that you've had to rely upon the firmness of the foundation that you have in the Lord. We've got to grasp this thought today and understand for Jesus Christ is enough no matter what we face. Now, before the trial and during the trial and after the trial, uh, we still believe some things that are crucially important in our life. Hardship should not change our understanding of the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. Hardship should not change our understanding of the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. God is so good to us, and I believe you would say amen to that. God is so strong for us today. He is also gracious with us today. God is more loving to us than we deserve, and God is more real than you can actually imagine. So we may not choose the dark paths that God sometimes puts us on, the challenges that we face, the situations that we go through. But honestly, we should be thankful for those places that we face and the events that we encounter. Permit me to teach you through the difficult times of life the importance of your faith in God. I, I want to give you a bottom line here. And this is something you need to remember. You can trust Jesus Christ no matter what happens to you. You can trust Jesus Christ no matter what happens to you. Regardless of how dark the night, regardless of how deep the trial or the valley that you're in, you can, you can rest with assurance that you can trust Jesus Christ no matter what happens. So Jesus Christ is a sure foundation to build your life upon. I don't want to be discouraging, but I think for each of us, despite all we face in life, a greater storm is coming. And I believe in the things that we're seeing that the world is facing today, that people are facing, our nation is facing, and globally facing. I believe that the coming of the Lord is a lot closer than we ever could imagine, ever think. And, uh, and it's unfortunate today because the church is living like he's never coming. No interest in the Word of God, no interest in the things of God. 
and people just don't put any priority on the Word of God, careless in their Christianity, careless in their walk with God, careless in their church work and, and attendance. And, and you know, and, and this is happening in churches all around, that people are just not focused on the Lord and His coming. From the text today, the storm that Jesus illustrates actually in this parable is not about the daily storms of life. I know we read these scriptures and we think that they pertain to the storms and the personal storms that we encounter, but rather these scriptures deal with the coming judgment of God that every person is going to face. And, uh, and I think this is something that we just turn our head away from and don't realize and don't want to realize that judgment is coming and a judgment is going to affect every person saved and lost. So there, there are many religious people who claim that they know God, but on the day of judgment, God is not going to recognize them. Why? Because they really never knew him. They knew him in language and what they talked. They knew how to talk Christianity, but they have never walked Christianity. And there is a vast difference in living what you say that you believe. Because of that, we need to really heed what Jesus tells us here in Matthew chapter 7, verses 24, down through 29, as he concludes the Sermon on the Mount. There's uh, coming a day of judgment when the righteous judge, who the Bible declares as being the Lord Jesus Christ, he will separate the sheep from the goat. The sheep are representative of those who know Christ and have received him. The goats are those who have rejected Christ. It's interesting that the Old Testament basically describes the judgment of God actually as a storm. Psalm 50, the psalmist said in verses 3 and 4, he says, Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Now, realizing this, God's wrath is coming like a storm, and folks, we've got to be prepared for it. This is not a scare tactic uh, message. It's just a reality that uh, we're going to face. I was thinking about it this, just this past week and even through this weekend that really the judgment of God is right on the threshold of the entire world. But people turn a blind eye and a deaf ear to it because they don't want to hear it. But you can do that, but you're not going to escape that. The reality of judgment is real. If you're not prepared for it, you will be forever dim, condemned before a holy and righteous God. I would hate to think that I'd heard the truth but didn't receive the truth. And because of that, I was condemned. So if you've been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, you can endure the storm of judgment that we will face. So in the final challenge here on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus challenges us to build our life on the right foundation. And he did that so that when we face God's judgment, we don't have to be afraid. There should not be any fear if you're living for the Lord. So the question then comes about, how do you prepare if we're going to survive for the coming storm of judgment? Well, I've got two lessons for you today that I pray will be informative to you and help you to remember. Number one is religious activity is no substitute for relational affection. Religious activity is no substitute for relational affliction, uh, aff affection. <laughs> affection, not affliction. There is a difference between being religious and having a deep abiding love for Jesus Christ. This world is full of religious people. There are religious people sitting in pews of churches today. There are religious people today around the world, even our community, and even, even in that church perhaps. But a person can say they know God and even actually do religious things, and still they can split hell wide open. Now, 
The key to avoiding that is making sure that you've got the right foundation. Have you got what it takes? <laughs> Have you got what counts today? Matthew 7 and 24 says, therefore, and that's an important word there, because it's a continuation of what Jesus was talking about in the previous part of chapter 7. He says, therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Now, Jesus talks about a builder that has a right foundation before beginning his work. You know, the foundation is described as the rock from the pages of God's Word. And this rock really is a picture of stability and safety. And in Christ, you are safe today. You can count on that. The same image is given in Psalm 27, verses 4 and 5. It says, One thing have I desired of the Lord, that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. Praise God. And in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me, what? Upon a rock. Thank God, we can be established, secured, and placed on the rock of ages today. Thank God we have a sure foundation. Now, we may shake on the rock, but I promise you the rock never shakes underneath you. Amen. So this rock is a picture today. God's willing to, it's a picture of, of safety and, and security that we have in Christ and God is willing to protect those who will call out to him in time of trouble. He has a beautiful picture of eternal security. How can you be on the rock and slide off? I mean, really. Folks, I have no time for people that cannot believe that God can save you and keep you saved. Honestly. They're calling God a liar. They're calling the word a hoax. Folks, you better be careful how you say that. I mean, really. Uh, I believe in what God's Word says. And, and, you know, if we will live for the Lord and sell out to Him, you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt Christ is real in your life. So the Old Testament reminds us that the ultimate rock of safety is the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. Isaiah said this in Isaiah 28 and 16, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a, listen to this, for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, he that believeth shall, shall not make haste. So, you know, there Isaiah made it plain, clear, and concise. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. He is our rock. He even said, upon this rock, <laughs> I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That means you and I who are born again and, and uh, have received him into our heart and our life, we are built on the Lord. We are established on him, and he is the rock of our foundation. So if you'll build your life on Jesus, your life will never be shaken. It doesn't mean that you won't face trials and difficulties and challenges in life. We all have those. But it means that you are on a sure foundation that you know your God never fails you. Amen. Now, every coin has two sides, though, doesn't it? So look at Matthew 7 and 26. He says, And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. Now, the builder has the wrong foundation. The sand which he built upon is a picture of instability. See, that's why you have so much instability in people who profess they know Christ, but they really don't because they have never really put their faith and confidence in the Lord. And that's why they, they're troubled. They, the, James said they're, they're like this troubled sea. They're driven. They're tossed. Folks, you have stability and strength in the Lord. Amen. And to realize building on the sand... It's a picture of the religious activity apart from the loving relationship with Jesus Christ. Be careful today. I, I'm, I don't profess today religion. I profess today relationship. And relationship puts me in relationship with Jesus Christ. See, religion, go back to the book of Genesis that we were on for six months. 
in, in the morning worship service. And you look at what happened. Cain, Abel, what occurred in their life. One brought the offering that God desired, that God demanded. The other one brought the offering of religion. And realizing that religion brings God what your flesh generates. Understand relationship is Christ in you. It is the hope of glory. So you've got to catch the imagery here of both of these houses look similar on the outside. They look, they have all the same appearance, the same beauty, attractiveness. And, and you know, if you look closer though, you'll find what makes these houses different is what's below the surface. You know, I've seen people, and, and they're coming from a building family, I, I'm always interested to see in these neighborhoods where they're building houses and, you know, you can identify, if you've had any experience with this, you can identify substandard material, stuff that's not going to last. In, in today's building environment, they use a lot of this chipboard. And I'm going to tell you, it gets wet, and you know what it does? It chips. It's a mess, you know. And, and you look at some of the things that they put in. I remember when we built our house, and had it built in uh, 1981. Every day we were out there at the building site. And my dad was with me. And I'm going to tell you, with a man that had the building expertise that he had, uh, he was the guy to take with you. Because he, he would tell the builder, he said, this is wrong, you need to, you need to. Do. And I'm telling you what, I'm sure the builder, and I'm not going to mention his name, I bet he was so glad to leave that building site that day. But one thing is a certainty, our house was built with stability. And, uh, and our house was built right. Amen. And, and, you know, I thank the Lord for that blessing today. Realizing today, you know, you can have a beautiful, ornate building, but if what you've got is not right underneath, the foundation is not right, it's not going to withstand the storms of life. So one had a solid foundation, the other one had actually no foundation at all. Matthew 7, 25, look at what happened to the house built on the rock. After the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. But then Matthew 7 and 27, it says, look what happened to the house built on the sand. It says, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. That house is a picture of your life without Christ. And the house that stood is a picture of a life built on the Lord Jesus Christ. We will either withstand the storms of God's judgment or we're going to fall as a result of it. See, the, there's, the judgment is the proof of the pudding, so to speak, of what you've done for Christ if it's real or if it's fluff, if it's relationship or whether it's religion. Because I'm going to tell you, religion's not going to stand. What's going to stand is the relationship that is built on Christ. If you build your life on Jesus, you may face bad things in life. And let me tell you, there is no promise that you will not face bad things in life just because you're saved. Bad things happen to good people who are Christians. But thank God, in Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things then will work together for good. So even through the storm, well, I don't understand. I've had, how many people... My Lord, if I had a dollar for every person that's asked me why in the years that I've been preaching, I tell you what, I could probably be a multimillionaire. I'm serious. Why, Pastor? Why, 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 why? Well, my question is this back to you. Why not? You're living in an imperfect world. You're imperfect. I'm imperfect. We face trials. We face things. But we've got to look at the scope of what the reason that uh, God maybe permits something to happen in our life. Could it be that God wants to increase and develop and intensify your faith? Yes, it is. And so God will do that. So realizing this, if you build your life on Jesus Christ and you face bad things in life, it is preparation for the final storm that is coming that you will endure. Praise God. So if your life doesn't have the sure foundation of Jesus Christ and you stand before his throne, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. Your kingdom is going to grumble. So how can we make sure beyond any shadow of a doubt that we have built our lives upon him? Well, the answer is found in verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth the sayings of mine, 
and do with them. In other words, just don't be a hearer of God's word, but be a what? A doer of God's word. He says, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Now, Jesus is saying, if you want to make sure that your life is built upon him, you had better hear the word he has said, and not only hear the word, but act on the word. Now, if you will act upon his word, Realizing this, you can know that your spiritual feet are planted upon the rock that will never fail you. If you will abide by the Sermon on the Mount, these, these scriptures are phenomenal. They will really develop you. If you will abide by the Sermon on the Mount, you can live with confidence that you're going to heaven one day. <laughs> I, and Paul said, I know in whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. So if kingdom living is your priority, you can then uh, know that your feet are planted upon the rock of ages, the Lord Jesus Christ. Religious activity doesn't necessarily equal salvation. Let me say that again. Religious activity doesn't necessarily equal salvation. If you want to survive the coming storms of God's judgment, you've got to build your, your life on the teachings of God's word rather than playing religious games. So what is the difference between being religious and obeying the teachings of Jesus Christ? You know, folks, listen. The scribes and the Pharisees cared more about keeping the letter of the law than the spirit of the law. And there's a lot of people that live to try to fulfill or keep the law. You can't do it. You're going to fail every time. Now, the law is a guidance system for you that you can use in your life that will help you. But they wanted to look religious without concerning themselves in being righteous. So if you outwardly obey, but inwardly you're not committed to Jesus, it's kind of all for nothing, isn't it? You mean your, your righteousness has to be inward first and then outwardly expressed. In other words, salvation is an inside job. And then what is done on the inside is going to show up as evidence on the outside. That little song, Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change. He has worked in me. Listen. Listen. You, you're subject to what God says in his word. You're, you're subject today to the entirety of the scripture, not pieces and particles and parts of. Uh, there are people in churches today that say they love God, but the living doesn't show it. To love God is to obey God. Say amen. amen. To love God is to obey God. Amen. If you're not obeying God, there's a question if you love God. Well, I just don't go to church anymore. Well, really, do you love God? I just don't read the Bible. I don't pray. Oh, where's your love for God? Amen. You, you got a fleshly religion that's not going to get you past go. Amen. If you're legalistic in your obedience and, and yet you don't love God, you're just like the person who disobe disobeys God to begin with. So a person who is truly born again they basically won't only obey God externally, but they will love God internally. See, you've got to get the internal love right for the external part of your living to become evident in your life. It's not about what you project to be, but it's what you really are. It's who you are. So if you're not careful, all you're doing is you, you get in a position of playing a religious game, which is nothing but an earthly sham, and you're going to pay with an eternal price. So you're, you're, you project on the outside, but on the inside, listen to this. You refuse to forgive. I mean, people refuse to forgive. Something's wrong on the inside if you can't forgive. You know, you, you, not only that, but you project on the, on the outside, but you refuse to forgive. You curse. You slander. You murder people with your words. You talk about people. I mean, you gossip about people. Your heart's not with God. Amen. Amen. You speak revenge. You speak hatred of other people. A Christian doesn't hate people. 
You hate sin, but you don't hate people. You hoard your resources. You won't give to the Lord. You worry. You complain. And basically, here's the bottom line. You don't trust God. You live in a sham. So what's the solution, preacher? Get your heart right with God. <laughs> to be honest, I mean, you, you can pretend you know God, but when the storm of judgment comes, it won't matter without a heart that is captivated by Jesus. It's nothing to begin with. So therefore, remember, there are two roads, two gates. He talked about that. One is a religious road that leads to death, destruction. The other is a spiritual road that leads to life and leads to eternal life. So there must be an inward change in your heart. Inward change. Jesus is not part of your life. He is your life. And, and if your foundation is built upon him, you recognize that. Being religious doesn't help you when you need him the most. Your religiosity is not going to get anything for you. No favor, no blessings, nothing. So when life unravels, it doesn't matter if you're religious. What matters is, do you really know God? And that's where it all comes down to. Let me give you the second point. And this one is, earthly victories point us to an eternal verdict. Earthly victories point us to an eternal verdict. So earthly victories over trials today is a hint that one day we will survive the greatest trial that we will ever face, and that's God's judgment. Your greatest trial is not the things that you have faced on this earth and that you have gone through. Your greatest trial that you're going to face is when you stand before the righteous judge. And man, he keeps a perfect set of books. Amen. God's going to examine your life and issue an eternal verdict about the condition of your soul. You ignore Christ, you shun Christ, you refuse Christ, you don't live for Christ, you try to even be religious maybe, but you've never received him, I'm going to tell you what the verdict is. He says, depart from me, you work of iniquity, for I never knew you. Amen. Now remember, as we taught on the week before last, about them coming and said, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, and haven't we done this, and haven't we done that? It's not based on your works. It's based on your relationship. See, salvation... Today, works are evidence of your salvation. Works are not going to get you there. Salvation is what gets you there. So realizing this, when Jesus, what Jesus is saying in Matthew 7 is not about our earthly struggles. We sometimes relate that to what we face in life, but that's totally missing the point here. But I've learned that through the struggles that we face, you know, it's, it's how earthly storms, they really offer us a clue to about how we will withstand the coming storm of judgment that we shall all face one day before the presence of God. If, if you won't be faithful in your earthly struggles, which basically will make you think you can withstand, what makes you think you can withstand then God's final judgment or God's final struggle or God's final storm when we stand before him? I'm telling you, folks, and I'm trying to make a, a solid impression on you today. The judgment bar of God, it's real. And it's going to be stern. If you don't love God when you need him the most, what makes you think you're going to love God when the storm of judgment comes? So realizing this, if you will love him on your worst day here, you can withstand the day of judgment that one day you stand before him. It's, it's one thing to know that God will bear your burdens. I'm glad to, we can know that God will bear our burdens. I'm glad he's given us that promise. It's another thing, though. See, it's one thing to know that he will bear your burdens, but it's another thing to watch him do it. Amen. So place your feet on the solid foundation of Jesus Christ today, for he has never shaken. What has you shaken and what's basically drawn you and pulled you down, let me tell you what, God's still standing. And you should be standing in his presence today and realizing whatever you face today, he is not washed away by the, by the rains of trouble. Uh, he, he doesn't sink amidst the floods of adversity that we go through. Uh, he will not. Today, he will not wilt even when the winds of tragedy prevail. Folks, he is strong when you're not. Amen. 
He is merciful to rescue when you and I don't deserve it. He will bear what you and I cannot bear. He will lift your head even when, you know, you fail in life. He is loving when your circumstances today make you put, get in a position of doubt. He is a warrior that will defend his children. Hallelujah. He is a refuge that gives rest to his people. He is a healer with all hope. When all hope seems lost, he is a healer. He is a shepherd that leads us through the darkest valleys of life. Man, we've got all that because he is a strong tower to all today that will run to him. Amen. Now, God, I believe with all this said today, God is to be praised. God is to be praised for giving us hope. God is good and we should run to him today. Thank God. He's always there. The issue is not how the storm ends, but the issue is how will your feet stay firmly planted on Jesus Christ. Folks, today you are in him if you are born again, and you need today to put your confidence and your faith in him. We must remain faithful to him regardless of how the circumstances turn out in life. doesn't make any difference. Knowing God is not a theory. Knowing God is reality. Hallelujah. He's real. He's a real God. They that trust in the Lord need never fear in the, in the trials of life. Why? Because the Word tells us we have nothing to fear. Amen. God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind, the Scripture says. Be founded on the rock. And when you're founded on the rock, then you're founded on Jesus, aren't you? You, you can't fall because he cannot falter. God has never failed. Do you hear that? God has never failed. And he's not about to fail you now. You can trust the Lord in all things, in all circumstances. But realize this. There is coming a judgment day. And if you don't believe it, then you need to go back and look at some of these things that I think Max has posted on Facebook, I mean on uh, YouTube that we've been teaching on the book of Revelation, on the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, things that we have revealed on Wednesday night pertaining to the events and timetable that we're living in and what has happened, what is happening now, and what is about to happen in the coming of the Lord, and realizing that after Jesus comes, man, let me tell you, judgment is right around the corner. Be prepared. Be ready. Thank God one day we shall behold him and see his glory, see him face to face. And friend, I'm... I'm looking forward. I don't want to hear God say, you should have done. Amen. I'm looking forward to God saying, thank you for doing. Amen. 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 And that should be our desire today. And we should live with this impending judgment that we are living by faith for Jesus Christ. And he'll never fail you. And the church said, Amen. thank you, Father, this morning for the time that we had to share your precious word. The final message in the Sermon on the Mount is a very stern message, but it's an eye-opener. It's a heart-shaker. It's one today that will stir up our spirituality and help us to realize that one day we shall stand before this righteous judge. Lord, the Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die. After that, the judgment. Judgment is something that no person will escape. I'm glad that I will be before you in the, in the beam of judgment. But God, I pray for those that are facing you in the great white throne of judgment. That they have never received you into their heart and their life. And Lord, they are condemned. But I'm glad that Lord, you can today turn that condemnation to salvation if they're called upon you. Thank you for the honor to have been in your house to open your word and to proclaim, Thus saith the Lord. May you today be honored in this place today of worship. May people come in with a heart of excitement and a heart of gratitude. And Lord, may they praise the Lord for great is our God and greatly to be praised. Have your way here today and we honor you, we love you, and we thank you for it's in Jesus' name we pray. All God's children say it a big hearty what? Amen. And they give the Lord a hand clap of praise for he is worthy to be praised amongst his people.